Uh, Sean Reynolds is my name. I joined the service here in 1972. Worked for the builder, I worked for six of the builders, and I came here in 72. I remained here then for in the prison service here until I retired in 2006 after completing 34 years. And over those years, I worked in most institutions in the country, Port Leash, Lockett House, I was, I was everywhere. Since I retired then, I look after the prison museum. The prison museum here was set up about two, year, two three years before I retired here by a man called Jim Petterbridge. Now, and since then, I've been looking after the museum on a part-time basis. But there's a lot of history here in the jail. The, this was first used. The first, used, first prisoner executed here was Kevin Barry on the 1st of November 1920. Now, there was an execution here in 1901, a man called John Toole, but that took place at the end of the A Division. Now, we're, in, we're here now at the end of the D Division, which the hanghouse has been here since the early part of the 20th century. Now, as I said there again, Kevin Barry being the first, and then to be followed by quite a number, possibly anything over 40 would have been executed here up to the close of the end of the executions in 19. Last execution took place in 1954. About 2004, we set up the museum here. Mm. It's to try and get a little bit of the background of, of the history of the prison mm -hmm. and captivate whatever artifacts that are still in existence that we can display here. Now, as I said, Mount Jail Prison here opened in March, the 27th of March 1850, for the sole purpose of sending prisoners out to Cam out to not out to Australia. But they ceased taking prisoners in 1853, and this became a convict prison there. Out for the weekend. That is the oldest piece that we have here. What is it? That is a convict frock that was given to convicts who wore, who tore the issue of prison clothing. If they tore their uniforms, the uniforms that time would have been made largely from wool and there would have been a black and grey stripe in them. But if they tore that, the convicts tore that, they were placed into this here. This thing here is known as the broad arrow. What does it mean? What's the broad arrow? It was put in all military equipment in England, all naval equipment, and everything was marked with the broad arrow. They were actually, they were pro, they were, broad arrow meant that anything with that, and even the convict's clothing, and the convict himself, they were the property of the crown. That's the cap. The cap was fitted over the, over the head of it to obscure the face of a prisoner. This meant that the prisoner could not make eye contact or signal to any other prisoner, which is basically that's the idea. It was to more or less to degrade the prisoner. Now there's there's an illustration of prisoners wearing the bead cap. This here is a table of drops. It was put together by a man called Dr. Samuel Horton. Now Horton was a Carlamon, born in 1821. He became a doctor, a physician. Remember the Zoological Society, he may have been a clergyman as well, but I'm not sure. But he made a study of execution and he came up with a mathematical formula to, so that an execution could be carried out without doing any serious damage to the, to the individual. Except you, death. You, or other than death, of course, that was the whole idea, <laughs> was to make it more, more humane. If death is ever humane. 105 pounds and under, you got eight feet of a drop. You weighed 140 pounds. This was all fully clothed. You were got six feet of a drop. Two ten, you got four feet of a drop. Now, they couldn't give you much less than two, uh, four feet of a drop because then it's strangulation. Mm. If you get, he was allowed to give a bit more than eight feet of a drop. If, but if he gave you nine feet of a drop, he would automatically take, decapitate the human being. Crazy. He would be left with a very messy situation. And that was uh, seen as inhumane? Oh, it would be if, you'd be if your head pulled off and your heart was still ticking. <laughs> but in there, in there, we, in this display case here, we have the hood, which went over the prisoner's head. We have the straps. We have a copper wire, which is all to do with working out the table of drops. You have a piece of chalk, which was to mark the position on the trap door where he wanted the individual to stand. You have the stick, which was used for, for measuring purposes. You have a little gauge there which tells you the thickness of the rope and tells you the strength of the rope. It's called a rope gauge. And other bits and bobs there that the, that the executioner would have had. The box that we're looking at now and that I'm taking the rope from 
is the executioner's box. It's where, where the ropes were kept. This box would go back to the year of probably, go back to about 1900 I would think. If we were in Crumlin Road Jail at this moment in time, there's a box something similar because Crumlin Road also executed. So every institution where they carried out executions would have had this box. It was a standard piece of kit. How thick is the rope? Rope is three quarters of an inch thick. It's approximately about 12 foot long, maybe a little less. This here is the brass noose. It's just, this is what they call a British noose. You can see how free that runs around that. Yeah. Whereas the noose is familiar with Western films and we see in America possibly in, in the Western days, was completely different. This is a British noose, but there was no problem when it was placed around a man's neck, or a lady's neck for that matter, it worked quite, of, quite effective. Mm -hmm. It did what it was supposed to do. There's the, the individual. The man had the death mask or a life mask of Albert Pierpoint. Albert was the last executioner to operate here in, in Mount Joy. Now, now, Albert Pierpoint, that's the period Albert Pierpoint lived. He had a pub in England, because the name of the pub was Help the Poor Struggler. And that's Albert's signature. Now I got that, it's a, I got that from a friend of mine, I said over in Wandsworth, he picked it up. That there is a rope made from bed sheets. Made from an early linen sheet. And what was it used for? Well, it was, it was the purpose of making that would have been for an escape. Did it work? No, it didn't because <laughs> the, the staff are very vigilant here and they were on the ball, so it, 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 was, it, was, it, was, it was found on a search. Now as you can see closely, then you can see it was made, it was made from the sheets of a bed. It was very skillfully done, but uh, it, was, it was filed, it was to help them to maybe get out over the wall. Tobacco was a big thing in prison. All staff smoked, all inmates smoked, and they're just a sample of old cigarette packets that were used over the years. That there is an exact replica of, of the hood that was placed over the prisoner's head. Now, it, 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 as I said, it's an exact replica because that was made from the original template and that came over from England. There again, it came over from Wandsworth. It, I would imagine it, it was disposable. I don't think there were a thing that you could reuse and, 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 and launder. But that is, that is this, the original Hood that was placed over the prisoner's head. That was placed over his head, and then the, the new stem was placed over that, over that. And the brass ring was onto your left hand side. So this could be the last thing a fella sees? Well, that's what all they would see, yeah. And he wouldn't be very long to see it because, uh, as I said, the execution was so fast that he would be dead within less than 10 seconds. It's, 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 hard, it's hard to imagine it now. We're looking back with the eyes of 2017, back to the 1950s and back before. It was a different in Ireland that time. It was many, maybe a way it was wrong to take a person's life, but I don't know. Maybe if, if there was no remorse and it was, that they, maybe they did deserve to die, I don't know. But there's, there's, there's supposed to be good in everyone. You know, sometimes it's very hard to find it. What would happen to an individual in the areas leading up to their execution here? Well, from the time you're sentenced in the court, the court stipulates that you're executed sometime in the, the week following the third, the third week, the third Sunday. So he would be put into the hang, well not sorry, I'm saying, I'm wrong, I'm wrong to say that. He was put into the condemned cell. Condemned cell is just out here at the end of the D1. And there he will remain in the custody of actually the prison and he will remain with two prison officers day and night. They'll be there to do it in shifts. If he's reprieved, we'll be lucky for him. And if not, sometime following the third Sunday, the week following the third Sunday, if there's no reprieve, he will be executed. Now, during that length of time, he would play cards with the lads and he'd be about crack where possible. And even some of the staff are quite good to him. He would be against regulations, but they would maybe, if the wife was making a few scones or you know, a lap of cake, they would, he would, they would bring it in. And they end up in here. That's a portable stairs that was used 
to allow the executioner and the doctor and possibly the priest to go up to the body after he had come through the trapdoor. Trapdoors are just over my head here. So when the trapdoors flew open and the individual came down, down the stairs would come the executioner, the doctor and the priest and there would be that would be shoved over because there was two members of staff down here also who assisted and to allow them to go up and to see that the prisoner was deceased. The individual who was to be executed, say the type of uh, Michael Manning in 1954, would have come through that door. You arrive in here, the rope was positioned on it up here. Everything had been got ready from the night before because Pierpoint and his assistant arrived at four o'clock. Everything was ready. There was a the two doors are closed. There's a position marked with a piece of chalk where he wanted them to stand. The piece of chalk marked what they call a, a letter T. That's the lever that controls the opening of the doors. There's a safety here. When the time was right, and the prisoner was arms were pinned and his legs were pinned and he was standing and there was an officer either side of him. This had to be withdrawn here by the, by the executioner. He then proceeded and he pushed that lever forward. And that's the last sound that the individual would hear. Whatever sounds he heard after that, but that is the last. And that released, that released the, the doors. It's easy to talk about now, but I wouldn't like to have seen it. A man to come through that door, put on a, put, standing on a, on a, on a chalk tea and a lever. Albert Pierpoint smoked a cigar, and I've said this before, that when he pinned the prisoner's hands behind his back in the condemned cells, which is just outside that door on the left-hand side, he would leave down the cigar, and it's quite possibly that the ash may not have fallen off that cigar until he got back to it, which would be seven, maybe 10 seconds later. Here you have, also on that crucifix, is the remains of a rose. We had a family of, we had relatives here of Harry, Harry Gleason, executed in 1941. They came here one day and they positioned and put a rose on that. Why do you think this place is important? It's important to keep it because it's part of Irish history. Keep it as a reminder of a time that possibly most people would like to forget. But it, it, it's very important. If, if, if we can't learn from our history, if mankind doesn't seem to learn from their history anyway, but it, it, this is important to keep this all. I know a lot of people would say pull the thing down and demolish it, but it's here as a reminder of a time past. I'd like to see this building being, rest being restored, and it is, it is reasonably good, a lot better than it was, as I said earlier on here, I wanted to put the roof on this, you'd want to have an umbrella in here, and the roof is so bad here that they had acros here holding it up, but uh, it should be restored, it should be complete, it could be, should be kept here, mm -hmm. and the museum here should be allowed to, should be allowed to grow, and younger, younger people take it over. I know it in the pecking order, this is a prison here, and at the end of the day, it's to save custody of the individuals here, and the museum is only a very minute part of that. But it's a small part. It's a small cog in a very, very large way. And it should, it should be allowed to grow, because without our past, we have no future. In, in, in one of the workshops here. But it was made to hide a mobile phone. You can see the mobile phone, which is a large mobile phone. Keith, did you see this? Oh, jeez. Yeah. And phone. mobile phones were difficult to hide back then.